Good morning, everybody. <laughs> Great, thank you. I would like to thank Rebecca and Richard for giving me this opportunity to be with all of you today. Um, unlike many of you in this room this day, or maybe some of you in this room today, I did not have the pleasure of meeting my paternal grandfather, Nicanor Reyes Sr. He was the founder of Far Eastern University, and he was, I only knew about him much because of the tales my mother told us when we were younger, and basically I knew he was an accountant, that he wanted to bring the accountancy to the Philippines because at that time it was only the British and the Scots who could practice in the country. He was very concerned about bringing quality education to the middle class, to the working class. And he was also, um, he, he, he was also very a good teacher. He was, many tell us that he was an excellent teacher and he mentored many who became well-known accountants in this country. As I grew older, I learned that my grandfather was really very much involved in the setting up of the first certified public accountancy exams in the Philippines. Who are CPAs in this room? Are there any CPAs? Well, that's a little tidbit for you. <laughs> he also took that first exam and he placed in the top 10, no less. He was very uh, concerned about, um, sorry, he, 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 he was very, uh, he, he passed away during the war. He passed away in World War II. And my grandmother passed away as well, and together with the two younger children. So it was my mother, Lourdes, my two uncles, Nicanor Jr. and uh, Alfredo, who were tasked with carrying on his legacy at FEU, as I am today. <laughs> Continuing this remarkable legacy was not imposed upon me. I never wanted really to work, I never planned to work in an educational institution. My parents never ever forced us to go into the family businesses or to take the professions they thought that they were good for us. So if you are in this room today and that's the way you're thinking and you want your children or those around you to take a particular profession or to go into the family businesses, I assure you this is the way to go. After we did all our careers in respective areas, all four of us are now at FEU today. It's actually like a second career to us. By coincidence, I had a lot of experience in the practice of both corporate and intellectual property law. And at FEU, I was uh, tasked with protecting the FEU brand. I don't know how many of you are in marketing here, but do you know what I mean about the brand? I mean, you, you, you have to be very, very careful about it. I see some heads nodding. And uh, I had to take, make sure that all the trademark and trade name and copyright registrations were in order. I had to go after the people um, with, who were using the, who, had, who were engaged in the unauthorized use of the name. I set up the bookstores, and apart from the textbooks and uniforms, we also had nicely uh, designed uh, branded items which we sold. But uh, more than anything, it took a lot of hard work and discipline, and those of you that are in marketing in this room will know that it takes a lot of hard work and discipline to build a brand, and that was what we were engaged in FEU. That was the brand, and it is now the brand that is recognized and respected today. By the way, when I started in 2004 with FU, there was not. FU was founded in 1928. There had never, ever, ever been a marketing office. I was the first person that was hired for marketing. So can you imagine? And my mother was even appalled because she said, you don't, you don't advertise for schools. That's, that's a vocation. I mean, you, 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 they come to you. You're not supposed to advertise. And I said, well, I'm really sorry, Mom, but the game has changed. <laughs> if you want to attract the good students, you have to advertise. So, During my time at FEU, our operations expanded to five schools in six campuses. So the first one you see here on the screen is the Institute of Technology. And then the second one is Far Eastern University in Diliman. We have a fantastic AstroTurf um, football field where that's where they play, the, once in a while they play the UAAP games. Uh, the next one is Far Eastern University Cavite. 
And the next one is, we brought back the high school to Manila because the high school in Manila was closed for a certain time and it went to other campuses, but with the um, advent of uh, K-12, to the senior high school, we now have a senior high school in Manila. And finally, to rise in Alabang this year in 2018, we have FEU Alabang. And to add to that, we also acquired five schools of Roosevelt College, Inc. So as you can see, we have expanded quite, uh, it's quite expansively, no? Uh, it gives me great joy that while serving at FEU, we continue to be faithful to my grandfather's legacy of providing affordable quality education to the middle and lower income families. Education is a service I take seriously. And according to the World Economic Forum, there is an indisputable link between ac access to quality education and social and economic development. In 2001, I was given the opportunity to set up Hands On Manila. Oh, I forgot to mention that at FEU, I checked the, I checked the statistics, particularly for today, 58% of the students and 55% of the, of the administration are all women. <laughs> so we are definitely, that's more than gender equality, right? We're a little bit even more than that. So um, edu in, in 2001, I was given the opportunity to set up Hands on Manila. We are an NGO dedicated to volunteerism. We are an affiliate of the US NGO Hands on Network later to become Points of Light Foundation. What we do is we recruit, train, educate, and mobilize volunteers to do service projects in the field of education, fields of education, healthcare, environment, and livelihood. Many of you, I, I'm, I was very happy to hear um, some names of BPOs in this room because you do work with us at Hands on Manila. So, right, uh, Baker McKenzie, uh, ADP in the past as well, and I think there's several names here, so several of you here. Now, uh, we, over the years it has grown, and I've been able to nurture this with a group of like-minded people. It, we are now a 30,000 um, contingent of volunteers, 30,000 strong contingent of volunteers. But for me, and for me, volunteerism is really a lot of things. It's about paying it back, or giving back, paying it forward, I'm sorry, giving back or making a difference. It changes perspectives and gives insights into the lives of others. It allows all of us to give hope just when we think there is none. And simply put, it's about making things better. I am most proud of Servathon, which is our service marathon flagship program, which happens annually. We started in 2005. I see some faces. Do you, you, did you join us in Servathon? That was great. That's, that, that's nice to know. Anyway, so we, we, in 2017, under the theme Mobilizing uh, Manila for Hope in Mindanao, and Carol ICM was involved in that, uh, we, over th we, we gathered over 1,000 volunteers to pack educational kits, um, sleeping kits, uh, insect traps, and home in a pail kits to give to uh, rural poor communities in Mindanao. Another opportunity to serve surfaced when I was asked to join in 2007 the found, um, and to be one of the founding members of Peace Tech Inc., a nonprofit organization dedicated to peace building through the use of information communications technology. After almost a decade later, I witnessed how Peace Tech contributed to the lives of more than 40,000 people. In its global classroom program, classroom video conferences, as you can see on the screen, on history and values education were conducted between three Christian schools, public high schools in Manila, Taguig, and Cebu, and 34 public high schools in Mindanao in the cities of Cotabato, Iligan, Samwanga, General Santos, and Marawi. Not only is Peace Tech helping to build understanding through this year-long interaction among the students, but it is also teaching the students, uh, sorry, teaching the teachers and students 
novel ways to learn. After I settled my second and last child, I set my sights on the grad in, in school, in college abroad. I set my sights on the graduate degree that I never was able to do while I was raising a family. It was only in 2013 that I obtained my Master in Public Administration at the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Now, I don't know how many of you in this room are 50 and above, but you can imagine going back to school in your 50s is really a challenge. <laughs> Sometimes I wondered where everything in my brain went. <laughs> While the course sharpened my managerial and leadership skills and updated my understanding of statistics, economics, technology, technology, and social media trends and leadership skills, it is the global perspectives I value most. We were 200 students from all over the world, and those networks and those friendships are the thing that I carry most, I will carry most for the rest of my life. After I completed my course, I opted to come back to Manila and to join FEU again, where, as you know today, we are facing rapid day-to-day -day changes in the field of education. Many graduates will end up working in fields that are different from the degrees they took. And it is said that your children, our children's children, will probably finish degrees and will find out that what they learned on the day of their graduation is all obsolete. Okay. Hence, the idea of embracing lifelong learning. Resources like massive open online courses, more popularly called MOOCs, abound at no cost. The inter internet contains a vast source of material for ideas, views, opinions, and perspectives in almost any field of interest. Mentors and professional gurus are everywhere, eager to share their wares. And there is media, which can instantly transport us to any part of the world. Therefore, it is important that we prepare our students to be mentally, physically, and emotional, emotionally ready for the future world. At FEU, it is our job to teach the students the 21st century skills of critical thinking, problem solving, creativity, and digital literacy, which are a far cry from the traditional education. We also have to inculcate in them the values and principles that will allow them to survive in the outside world, to prepare them for jobs, and rapidly change, in rapidly changing workplaces to develop pride of school, pride of place, and pride of country, and to become global citizens. In 2015, I was again given another opportunity to serve. I was struck by how many in the NGO world used to approach me to ask for legal advice. Free legal advice, of course. <laughs> and. Uh, it struck me that many of them would probably never be able to go uh, approach a lawyer or pay for his services. So I thought, what if we did a simple guide to Philippine law? Uh, a sort of Philippine law for dummies. Uh, why not? So I approached a classmate and very good friend and said, why don't we do an everyday guide? Uh, we, we, why don't we write a very simple guide to everyday law in the Philippines? That light bulb moment resulted in these two books. In 2015, uh, Laws for Life was printed, it was published, I'm sorry, and it won a National Book Award for Best Book in Professions in 2016. In essence, what it contained was advice on Balik Bayan and senior citizen benefits, what to do if you lost your birth certificate, uh, the Kasambahay Law, Many came to me after and said, oh my gosh, I'm not so sure I want to share this information, but it's all the information you should be following, all the rules you should be following if you have staff at home and otherwise. And then uh, uh, real estate. 
purchase of real estate, all the documents you need, the taxes you would probably have to be pay. Taxes may change today, but the process will still be the same. No? And the last was inheritance and estate laws. So in 2017, December, just last December, we launched a second book, Laws for Life 2, because of popular demand. And these ones include what do you do when you get into a car accident? <laughs> uh, what is it? What is 13-month pay? And who is entitled to 13-month pay? Um, intellectual property, uh, businesses. If I want to go into business, what do I do? Sole proprietorship? Do I do a corporation? Do I do uh, all of the above? So these two uh, books are available. But what pleases me most is not really that we, I mean, um, the publication, of course, is, makes me happy. But what makes us, me most happy is that when the security guards and when my housemaid staff come and say, Ma'am, we really found the book useful. And maybe it is because we wrote it in very simple English and there were no, almost no legal terms. Of course, we still had to put in legal terms. And when we did have the legal terms, we would explain in simple English what the terms were all about, what the terms referred to. No? While I'm grateful that these opportunities in my life abound, life is not without its challenges. There were obstacles I had to maneuver along the way because of my multiple roles as wife, mother, daughter to parents, and professional. Raising children can be heartwarming, but in this day and age of reality television, the lightning speed of information, whether both good and bad, and the frequent breakup of families and marriages, it can be a real challenge. I saw a poster the other day uh, which I thought resonated. It said, raising children is, is like, uh, I'm sorry, now I'm, I'm, having a, I'm drawing a blank, but raising children is, is like a walk in the park. And then in the bo bottom it says Jurassic Park. <laughs> So that was, that, was, that was funny. I said, that's a good one. We are fortunate to live in a country that is ranked number one in gender equality in the Asia Pacific region and number five in the world. That's amazing, okay? According to the 2013 World Economic Forum Global Gender Gap Report, and yet women today struggle with this equality. Because we are now able to do everything and anything and can aspire to do the things that only the men could do before, there is formidable pressure to do it all, right? And there's an expectation that we have to do everything perfectly. Do you agree with me? That we have to do it well, pa. I mean, we have to do everything and then we have to do it well. So that's... That says it all, don't you think? This was not the case in our parents' time, nor in our grandparents' time. But the truth is, there is only so much we can do, and we are caught in the middle. And we still cannot have it all. So if I were to advise my daughter, or the women that surround me today, I would give the following advice. Number one, take care of your family first at least until your children are grown up. Now I realize I'm speaking from a position where I have those choices and those options. That might not be the choices everybody in this room will have. Okay. I, uh, when I first, um, when they were growing up, I decided to take a consultancy job. So it, it was not a full-time job. The second thing is you stay committed to your career as much as possible, for as much as, for as much as possible and as much as you can. So even if you are trying to raise your family, don't lose sight on what you want to do in your career. Think about it, find ways to do a little bit of it, or find ways to be able to pick up again once your children are grown up. Okay. The third one is choose a partner who understands what you want to do, and who will support you in more ways than one. Now, you notice I said partner. 
I didn't say husband because I don't know with our children nowadays, can you agree with me? I don't think they want to get married anymore. <laughs> and they don't want to get married um, early. I had a conversation with my daughter and I said, you know, when we were 25 years old, we'd start worrying if we were not in a relationship and wanting to get married and wanting to have children. And she said, Mom, that's so young. Okay, I'd start worrying at 35. That's definitely a change from before, right? So when I say support, I don't mean financial support necessarily. You have to pick a partner that understands where you want to go, what your passions are, and that will not hinder you from getting there. And lastly, just do everything to the best of your abilities. Because the truth is, you can always ask for help along the way. So don't hesitate to ask for help. You don't have to know it all right away. Okay. To do all this, I had to learn more. I had to move out of my comfort zone and to venture into areas that were predominantly dominated by men. I had to learn to keep learning on the job. And most of all, I had to be brave. In 1992, my legal career was interrupted when I left with my family to live in Lima, Peru. It was there that I was appointed Philippine Honorary Consul. Alberto Fujimori was Peru's newly installed president. And the country was celebrating the successful capture of the revered Abimael Guzman, the head of the Shining. I don't know if you remember, Abimael Guzman was the head of the Rebel Sendero Luminoso movement, the Shining Path movement. It was the first time that I had done a job in the foreign affairs arena. I suddenly had to devour everything historical, cultural, economic, and political about the world at large, and about the region, Latin America in particular. Now, if you live all the way in Asia, I can assure you that from the newspapers and everything, you will read this much news about Latin America. It's mostly the United States and Europe, and then a lot on the Philippines. Huh? I had, to, I had to learn to issue visas to attend to the needs of all the Filipinos there and to organize cultural events. I had to study the ways of protocol and liaise with my supervising embassy in Brazil and later Argentina, and also with the Peruvian Department of Foreign Affairs. And I had to learn how to do all of this in Spanish. <laughs> so, I, uh, one of the things that, remi you know, that I remember most is I had a lot of Filipinas that came to me and they were married to Peruvians. And their stories were all so interesting because they met Peru the Peruvians either in Japan because they were entertainers or they met them in Russia in study programs. And they would ask me because I was the only one who represented the Philippines in Peru to translate documents from Filipino to Spanish, or from Spanish to Filipino. Now I will tell you that I am not an expert in both languages, and so it used to take me hours to try and, and, um, and do this. And I would ask them, but how do you communicate with each other? Oh, in broken Japanese. And how did you get married? Oh, you know, he just, we, he just, spo he just asked me with some hand symbols, and then he drew this is incredible. I said, this is fant what a fantastic story. They, he drew, you know, two people and then a house. And, and I said, and you got married this way? <laughs> that's a very unique way to marry. And I, and I, was just, I was just thinking, what made you think that's what he wanted you to do? Maybe he, was, he could have been asking him to go, to go live with him. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, when I first joined FEU, I did not have all the necessary managerial skills expected for the job. I was trained in the legal profession, and as my responsibilities expanded, I had to learn to find ways to, um, to, I had to learn about external relations, bookstore operations, publications, media centers, performing arts cultural groups, and just recently, alumni relations. These are all responsibilities I handle today. And yes, there were mistakes along the way, but these were all part of the learning process. 
some people in the in the room are part of my marketing staff and they will attest to the fact that I had to really learn about digital marketing. When I joined in 2004, the big thing was to come out with an ad in the newspapers and to use the newspapers. Nobody reads the newspapers. I mean, I'm talking about our clientele, the students. They do not read the physical newspaper anymore today. So, and I'm sure all of you realize that you have to go digital, okay. Which is also one of the reasons I went back to school at that late age to pursue my master's degree. This master in public administration enabled me to learn about management and leadership and to leapfrog many of the skills and knowledge I had to acquire. Applying to Harvard University was in itself a very bold and brave move. I never dreamed that I would be accepted to such a prestigious program. And it turned out to be one of the best years of my life. So the next time you find yourself in a situation wondering whether you want to do something or not, I would say take a deep breath and take a plunge. And remember, life is never perfect. You are not Wonder Woman, okay? But you would love to look like this, right? I mean, we would love to all be like this. But you can always try to do your best and learn along the way. I challenge you to take the risk because nothing can replace experience. The words be brave were the last words my, my grandfather uttered to her mother, my mother, before he died in the hands of the Japanese. It has now become the battle cry of our sports teams. It is also what we ask everybody at FEU to emulate and aspire for. As I ask of you today, stand up and serve and be brave. Thank you. Thank you.